So again, welcome to today's webinar, Making and Testing High Moisture Cottage Foods. This is um, the continuation of our Food Safety Foundations webinar series. Uh, during the January, February, and March webinars, we set the stage for safe food preservation and preparation by discussing pathogens that can contaminate food and cause foodborne illness, what pathogens need to grow, and how your actions can impact this growth. Then, uh, then we reviewed best practices of a thorough sanitation routine. In April, we reviewed a variety of equipment needed for different food preservation methods with an emphasis on how these contribute to the safety of your value added and preserved foods. In May, we discussed making preserved fruit spreads like jams and jellies. In June, we covered pickling produce. And then in July, we covered canning acidic and acidified foods. August, we kind of switched gears a little bit and we had some guest speakers and we reviewed making and selling juice in Minnesota. Then in September, we discussed canning low acid foods. And last month in October, we reviewed drying produce with a focus on dehydrating and freeze drying. In case you were unable to join us for one of those previous webinars, Lauren is sharing a link to our YouTube channel playlist in the chat where you can view any of those recorded webinars. So I'm Amy Johnston and I'm today's speaker. I'm a regional extension educator with the University of Minnesota on our food systems team, specifically working in the area of food safety. Also with us today is Lauren Backus, who's here to assist with any technical difficulties. You can direct message Lauren in the Zoom chat if you're experiencing any problems. Uh, she'll also be sharing links and some information in the chat throughout the webinar, but don't worry if you forget to save a link, I will include all of them in the follow-up email that'll go out early next week. So let's get started with tonight's topic. So today we're going to start with just a brief overview of the Minnesota Cottage Food Law in case there's anybody that's not um, completely familiar with it. Then we'll dive right into the topic of water activity, including a review of what it is and the foods we would be concerned with. I'll highlight pathogens of concern and how you can minimize the risk of these um, this pathogen growth. Then I'll share details about a practical tool that the University of Minnesota developed to, en to enable cottage food producers to be able to do recipe development at home. And then lastly, we'll review some recipe considerations if your water activity is too high. And then I'll take questions at the end. Again, Lauren will be sharing some links throughout the webinar, but if you miss one, they will be included in the follow-up email um, early next week. So whether you're joining us to benefit your food business or you just want to learn more, I hope you leave this webinar with increased confidence in your ability to prevent foodborne illness. So by the end of this webinar, you'll be able to explain water activity as it relates to the types of foods allowed for sale as cottage food products, be able to use safe food handling practices to minimize the risk of foodborne illness, and be aware of a practical tool that you can use for recipe development. So let's start with that review of the Minnesota Cottage Foods Law. The Minnesota Cottage Foods Law is an exemption from food licensing. So this means the requirements and rules for food businesses such as licensed food manufacturers or processors do not apply to cottage food producers. The cottage food law contains its own requirements and rules that must be followed. Cottage food producers must register with the Minnesota Department of Agriculture or the MDA. And while there are not routine inspections of cottage food businesses like there are for licensed food um, businesses, the MDA has the authority to inspect your business if there's a complaint or if there's a foodborne illness event. Cottage food producers are able to make certain non-potentially hazardous foods 
in your own home and sell them directly to the end consumer. So this means you can use your own household kitchen equipment. There are no requirements or restrictions on the type of equipment. And non-potentially hazardous foods are foods that when, when they are properly prepared and handled have a very low risk of supporting the growth of pathogens that can cause foodborne illness when consumed. And then you can sell these directly to the end consumer from your home, at a farmer's market, at community events, or online. Your cottage food products must be delivered directly to that end consumer, uh, with the exception of allowable pet treats under the cottage food law. Those certain pet treats can be shipped uh, via the mail. And then the last um, requirement is to have this statement posted um, at your booth, whether you're at a farmer's market, a community event, or selling from your home, or if you're using a website to, um, to sell, you need to have the statement, these products are homemade and not subject to state inspection. Um, and this is important to inform your, your, your customers about how their product was made so they can make an informed decision. So this is why it's been so important over these last um, several months as we've gone through these different topics to really understand the, the food safety and the food science behind each of these different kind of um, non-potentially hazardous food products. Um, so you can talk to your customers about um, your process and what you've done to make them safe. All cottage food products must be labeled with the information that you can see on the screen. Um, so it must include or your business name if you've registered with, with a business name, your registration number or address. Many people use their registration number. The date the food item was prepared, have an ingredients listing, and then specifically highlighting any of the top or the, the major nine food allergens. And then again, that statement of these products are homemade and not subject to state inspection. So all of this information is really important. Again, so your customer can make an informed decision when purchasing your product. If you're packaging the product like at the point of sale, like many baked goods, um, so if you're have a a bulk display at your farmer's market table and you know people are selecting how many um, items they want and then you're packaging at that time you need to have all of this information posted and then also available for your customers to take with them if they choose <clears throat> so what does non-potentially hazardous mean so a non-potentially hazardous food does not support the rapid and progressive growth of infectious or toxigenic microorganisms. So what does that mean? <laughs> um, so that means that the, the food, or yeah, that, that food is not able to um, support the growth of, of pathogens, of bacteria, the bacteria, the pathogens, they can't get at um, the nutrients and the other factors that they need to grow and survive, um, or the infection, or um, or the toxigenic microorganisms. So that also then means that those bacteria that may produce a toxin, um, the food does not support that bacteria um, producing that toxin. A non-potentially hazardous food does not support the growth and toxin production of Clostridium botulinum. So a very specific um, pathogen called out um, in that bullet point. A non-potentially hazardous food um, can be a food with a water activity value of 0 0.85 or less. A non-potentially hazardous food can be a food with a pH level of 4.6 or below when measured at 75 degrees Fahrenheit, so room temperature. And if you think back to the, 
the July um, webinar where we talked about canning acidic and acidified foods. Um, and then also in the, the February webinar where we talked about what pathogens need to grow and how you can control that. That 4.6 pH is that, that sweet spot where anything 4.6 or lower, the pathogens that we're concerned with that can cause foodborne illness aren't able to survive or grow. That pH, that 4.6 or below, also prevents the Clostridium botulinum spores from germinating into vegetative cells and then producing a toxin. And then lastly, non-potentially hazardous foods could be a food in an unopened hermetically sealed container that is processed to be shelf stable. So what does non-potentially hazardous then mean um, with the types of foods that are allowed for sale as cottage foods? So the cottage food law specifically has um, these criteria um, written into, into the law. So the, a cottage food must be that non-potentially hazardous food. So those items that we reviewed on the previous slide. And for home processed and home canned foods, they can be pickles, vegetables, or fruits with an equilibrium pH of 4.6 or lower, and then made in Minnesota, those home processed, home canned foods. So for today's discussion, we're going to be uh, talking about water activity and the types of foods that we would use water activity uh, measurement to ensure safety. We've spent um, previous webinars talking about, you know, pickling produce, um, canning those acidic and acidified foods and fruits, and then making jams and jellies, all of those things falling under that, um, that first bullet point. So again, when we're talking about cottage foods and then we're focusing on our, our water activity related foods today, um, we want to have that water activity of 0 0.85 or less. Um, because if we think back to the February webinar um, where we talked about those controls of pathogens, that water activity of 0 0.85 or less, it, um, foods that have that water activity if they become contaminated, pathogens have um, a very hard time surviving and growing because they're not able to easily access water molecules. Those water molecules are gonna be bound and we'll, we'll dive into that more um, here on the next slide. So that quick, let's do a quick water activity refresher. Um, so water activity is the ability of free water molecules to bind with other molecules um, in, a, in a food. So those other molecules can be, can be salts. So if we're, we're curing something, um, they can be sugars. So sugars that are naturally present in foods um, or sugars that are added um, where we're making preserved fruit spreads or for baking. Um, or those other molecules can be pathogens, those harmful bacteria that can cause um, foodborne illness when eaten. So the water activity scale goes from zero to one and foods with that water activity closer to one, um, so above 0 0.85, they can be more, mo they tend to be more moist. And again, if that water activity is above 0.85, um, if that food becomes contaminated, it can be easy for pathogens to have access to, to the water that they need to grow and survive. And then drier foods have a water activity lower than 0.85. So a couple examples um, that we've, we've used um, in our previous webinars. So our fresh cranberries have um, a very high water activity, um, very close to one. And our dried cranberries um, have a water activity that is um, right around 0.6, so a lot lower. Additionally, our fresh grapes have a very high water activity, very close to one, um, 
but our grape jelly has a, a low water activity around 0 0.8, 0 0.82, um, because we've added um, in a, a lot of sugar and we've cooked it down. Um, so the water molecules that are present are, are binding, binding with, with sugar. So it's important to remember that moisture content is not the same as water activity. You can have foods with a high moisture content, so like our, our jelly on the previous slide, um, but have a lower water activity. It's all about how are those water molecules behaving in that food. Um, so in our, our jelly, they are behaving by interacting with all of the sugar molecules that are present. Okay, so these are the food categories um, that all use water activity as a control for food safety. So we have breads, baked goods, frostings, icings, confections and candies, dried foods, syrups, preserved fruit spreads, and baked or, baked or dehydrated pet treats. Um, and I should say these, these food categories are what we're talking about with um, keeping cottage foods in mind. So I've bolded breads, baked goods, frostings, and icings because these are the categories that I'm going to focus on um, a little bit more as, as examples um, when we're talking about the testing and the recipe considerations. Um, for more information on dried foods, you can watch um, last month's webinar and then the preserved fruit spreads um, reviewing that, that May webinar. So when we think about these categories of um, cottage foods, specifically, let's think of the baked goods, we need to consider both um, what and how uh, pathogens can be inactivated uh, during pr preparation, and then how to minimize the risk of cross-contamination after that food has been prepared. So think of during decorating or, or packaging. So Thorough baking and using safe ingredients like using pasteurized milk and pasteurized dairy products. Um, using those pasteurized products lessens the risk of pathogens or bacteria being present. And that thorough baking will inactivate any pathogens that like salmonella or E. coli that could just be present. Using safe food handling practices after Preparing that food after that baking, so while you're either decorating or packaging, can prevent cross-contamination from pathogens like Staphylococcus aureus or viruses like norovirus or the hepatitis A virus if you happen to um, be sick with that or somebody in your household um, is sick with, with any of those. So not working while sick, using proper hand washing, and proper usage of single-use disposable gloves, so no bare hand contact with these prepared foods. All of these are really important in um, preventing that cross-contamination. And it's really, really important to prevent this cross-contamination of um, viruses because viruses don't need moisture to grow or survive. They would be able to survive on those foods for an extended period of time if they did become contaminated. And then also Staphylococcus aureus, it can grow at a water activity of um, 0 0.86. So that's really close to that 0 0.85 that we are um, needing to achieve for cottage foods. So if your recipe or your food is, is off a little bit, it's not prepared correctly or it's the recipe itself isn't developed to have a low enough water activity and that food becomes accidentally contaminated, um, that Staphylococcus aureus um, pathogen could um, grow and survive and, and cause uh, foodborne illness. So how do you make a safe product? Um, for those of you that have been on these previous webinars, this is um, a broken record using safe research-based recipes and procedures. 
Um, so I included a few on, on the slide. Um, the National Center for Home Food Preservation, that would be a great place for dried foods and jams and jellies. Um, so again, those are um, water activity is, is important in their, in their food safety. Unfortunately, the National Center is not going to have um, any baking recipes on it. So for, for baking recipes, those icings, those frostings, um, looking at education institutions like extension or using research articles and case studies. Additionally, the Minnesota Farmers Market Association, MFMA, um, they have developed um, two different lists to help cottage food producers. Um, and these lists are um, reviewed periodically by um, the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, um, food scientists, and the, the Extension Food Safety Team in conjunction with MFMA and, and Minnesota Cottage Food Producers Association. So these two lists, there's one for human foods and then one for the allowable pet treats. And they provide a really good starting point of um, what would be allowed for sale um, or not um, as, as a cottage food. And then Minnesota Farmer Market Association also maintains a document with um, some tested recipe listings. So Lauren's gonna share a link to MFMA's Cottage Foods Academy in the chat. Um, and I encourage you to, to check that out. So like I, I said, you know, there's there's limited recipes out there um, that have that tested water activity value um, linked to them. They're, they're starting to, to become more, but they're still not as um, bountiful as our other food preservation methods. So because of this being so limited, many people need to develop their own recipe and then uh, they're having it tested in a lab um, which can be costly when you need to send in multiple samples if that, that final water activity um, isn't as low as you need it. There's also water activity testing devices that you can um, use at home, um, but their price tag can be a barrier. Um, some of these can run from around $1,000 to a few hundred dollars. Um, so these are some examples that range um, from that, that several hundred to a few thousand dollars. So the, this is where um, the University of, of Minnesota um, stepped in to, to try to help solve solve this problem of this access, this affordable access to a way to, to test water activity at home for, for recipe development. So a graduate student uh, received uh, grant funding to develop a process for cottage food producers to be able to test water activity at home, and then also to develop a reduced sugar bread recipe, um, like banana bread, zucchini bread, that um, still met the water activity parameters of 0 0.85 or less. So they tested many devices for accuracy and durability, and again, had that accessibility in mind, because um, remember the, the cost of, of many of these devices. They partnered with the Minnesota Cottage Food Producers Association for recipe testing and development. And then after about two years of research and testing, the University uh, of Minnesota College of Food, uh, Agriculture, and Natural Resource Sciences in the Ubink Lab um, released a practical tool that cottage food producers can use to test water activity at home during recipe development. So this, this is not a water activity meter. Um, this is a, a, a practical tool that consists of a few different parts to um, get you to that, that water activity value um, that you need to know when doing recipe development. So the tool consists of actually a humidity reader device. Um, that is that Eli Tech device, that orange um, device that you can see on the screen. There's some standard solutions 
to determine the accuracy of the device. And I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a couple slides. And then the Excel correction tool, and which contains a formula that will convert humidity to water activity. So in uh, a very general overview, before we dive in deeper, this tool is measuring the, the humidity, the water vapor of a food in a closed container. And then the Excel correction tool that was developed converts that to a water activity value. And it's important to have the Excel correction tool calibrated um, using those standard solutions. Um, so you get a very, you get it, you get an accurate um, measurement for, for your device. Each device is going to read a little bit differently. Um, again, because um, each device is different um, and it, it's, it's not a water activity meter. It's, it's using um, um, humidity and then we're converting that, that value into a water activity um, value. So let's dive into that and it'll um, hopefully make a little bit more, more sense as we, as we talk through it. Okay, so the first image you can see on the screen is uh, that um, humidity meter, that Eli Tech device, and it is attached to a, a jar that has a solution in it and the solution or the jar is labeled 0 0.76. So this is showing that standardization or that calibration um, process using one of the standard solutions. Um, you can see then that our, our standard solution has that water activity of 0.76. So we know what its water activity is. And in the red box, the humidity is 75.2%. Um, so to convert humidity to water activity, we're um, dividing by 100 or moving that decimal place over two spots to the left. So with that in mind, you would think that the device should read 76% um, um, humidity. And again, it's, you know, each device is going to have um, a little bit different accuracy um, or, or um, yeah, accuracy. So this is where that Excel correction tool is going to come in into play. And we'll talk more about that on the next slide. Here's an image of one of the jars that is connected to the humidity um, reader device. And you can see that in the bottom of the jar, um, there's some candies. The jar is sealed um, and there's no airflow um, getting in. And then you'll see the um, one of the probes um, is in that, that head space. So what's happening in the jar is because the jar is sealed, that is that over a period of time, the the humidity that water vapor from the food is going to um, evenly distribute throughout that jar so that that probe um, there in the airspace or the headspace of the the jar is going to measure that humidity um, once it is at equilibrium and so that's going to tell us that the air and the food um, have the same humidity um, then we can calculate that water activity. So this is a screenshot of the Excel correction tool um, where we are standardizing or we're testing all of those standard solutions and we're putting the values into our tool. So it's customized or calibrated directly to your device. So as I mentioned, there's the four different standard solutions. There's 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.76, and 0.92. So those are the water activities of those solutions. 
And the reason why we do four solutions is so we get enough data points to make the, the formula of the, the correction really accurate. And it, you're going to test each solution or take the measurement of each solution five times. And it sounds like a lot, so that's like 20 different readings, um, but this only needs to be done um, before you use it the first time and then recommended to do it annually thereafter just to make sure the device is still um, functioning properly. So you put in all of those, um, those data points and your, now your, your uh, formula is gonna be customized to your device. So if you have a device and one of your friends has a device, um, you can't swap them out for each other and use your own original spreadsheet because it's not going to, um, to match. So use your device with your spreadsheet that you um, calibrated. This is a screenshot then of what the formula is going to, to spit out um, once you start to measure a food sample. So in the yellow cell, um, we measured a, a, a sample of, of bread and our water at, or our humidity device spat out that the humidity was 77.1%. So we divided that by 100 and we got 0.771. But we know that that's not um, completely accurate because of just the limitations of the device. So when we put that 0.771 into our calibrated Excel tool, it gives us an actual water activity of 0.806. Then with a range, that standard deviation, it's saying that um, for accuracy, it could be anywhere, the water activity could be anywhere from um, 0.827 to as low as 0.794. So you'll see the gr green check mark. So that is really well below that threshold of the 0 0.85 that we are looking for um, to have a safe cottage food product. So good to go on that recipe. We tested another sample and we got a humidity reading of 0.7 or a humidity reading of 77.8% on our device. So we divided by 100 and we get a measured water activity of 0.778. But again, because of the limitations of the device, it's not a true water activity meter. We need to plug it into our calibrated Excel correction tool and um, get what our actual water activity and that range um, is. So this is saying that the water activity is 0.814 with a potential range of 0.836 to 0.802. And the tool is then giving it a, a yellow exclamation point because it is the high end of that range is somewhat close to that um, 0.85 threshold that we need to be at or below. So consider, you know, testing um, a few more samples of that same product, um, remaking that recipe again to make sure you're getting the same results um, that are all below that 0.85. And then the last type of results you can get. Um, so we tested another sample. Our humidity read on the device was 82.0%. So we divided by 100, got the measured water activity of 0.82. Again, because the device is not a water activity meter, we need to plug that number into our calibrated Excel correction tool. Um, so we get an actual accurate water activity. And the Excel tool is um, saying that the actual water activity is 0 
um, with a range of anywhere from 0.887 to 0.853. So that and the entire range are above that threshold of 0 0.85. So redevelopment um, of your recipe is needed. So a few considerations or best practices for use it, when using this practical tool. So foods with a hard, a hard outer crust, um, so sometimes some breads, um, test a piece that, test one sample that has crust and then another um, sample without crust. And we wanna make sure that both of those um, are at that um, 0 0.85 or below. So foods with multiple components that are assembled after baking or cooking, we want to test each component separately. So think of cookies or cakes that are decorated, you know, after baking. That frosting or that icing needs to have a water activity of 0 0.85 or below, you know, and so does the, the cake or the cookie. Um, another example could be some pastries that are filled um, with a non-potentially hazardous filling after baking. You know, we wanna make sure that all of those components are safe. And then lastly, foods with a filling that are baked or cooked as part of the final product, um, use a sample that has all of the components. So this could be something like a, a fruit danish or bars or cakes with multiple layers, um, breads that have cheese added to them um, before baking. You want to make sure all of those components are captured in that, that final baked product. Um, so we have a, a pretty detailed um, user manual or operation manual for this practical tool. Um, on the University of Minnesota webpage, um, and Lauren will share that in the chat. And then if you are interested in, in using this, you can order it through the Minnesota Farmers Market Association. You can purchase the entire kit, which would have the, um, the humidity device reader, the standard solutions, and some jars, and then you'd get the Excel correction tool as well. Um, the full kit is just about $80. Um, so if we think back to those um, um, those water activity meters that we had some examples up on the screen, you know, those were at at, at minimum um, a few hundred dollars um, up to into the thousands of dollars. So again, they met the the research outcomes of of the lab trying to develop a, a tool that was accessible from a price point um, to help cottage food producers um, do recipe development at home. But again, it's really important that, you know, this is not um, a substitution for a, a lab tested um, water activity. Um, this is a, again, a tool to help with that recipe development. So you're not having to send in sample after sample to, to a lab. So what if you're, uh, you test your recipe and the water activity is too high? Um, these are just some, some suggestions to, to kind of get you thinking about what you might be able to do to your recipe to, to lower that water activity. So, you know, if you're going for something that is supposed to be really crispy, um, like crackers um, or pet treats, you know, consider dehydrating after baking. That's going to remove more moisture. So any moisture, uh, water molecules that are, are present then in the food are going to be able to um, be bound with the sugars that are present. Um, look at, you know, can you adjust the size or the thickness of your food? Again, if you're able to make it a little bit thinner or a different shape, uh, more water will be evaporated out during that baking or that cooking process. So the water molecules that are left are going to be bound to the sugar molecules um, that are still present. You know, can you look at adjusting the baking time and or temperature? You know, what happens if you 
um, use a lower temperature and cook for longer or a higher temperature and cook for a shorter amount of time? Um, what does that do to your water activity um, without impacting your, your, your final product quality? Look at the type of sugar you're using, both the amount and the type. Um, so again, remember, we know sugar is really good at binding water molecules. So those water molecules um, aren't available for pathogens to, to bind with. Um, so if you are able to increase your sugar a little bit without impacting your quality, that could be an option. Um, but then also the type. So for example, honey has a water activity of 0.552, while maple syrup has a water activity of 0.9. Um, so if you're using those as your sweeteners, you know, is there a way to use a little bit less maple syrup, use some, some honey in place of that or granulated sugar, um, so experimenting with some, some different sugar sources. And then lastly, looking at the water activity of other ingredients. Um, so we know that our, our fresh fruit, our raw fruit, has a really high water activity. Um, can you replace some of that fresh fruit um, with berets or dried fruit? Um, because those are going to have a, a lower water activity. Um, looking at if you're using butter in your recipe, uh, salted versus unsalted. Um, so salted butter has a water activity that can range from 0.89 to 0.95, while unsalted butter um, can be closer to 0.98. So looking at that, um, and then also if you're using dairy ingredients in your recipe, looking at you know what happens if you use milk versus cream versus sour cream versus yogurt, um, you know, their water activities are, are somewhat um, similar, um, but if you're, if you're only off by a little bit, maybe switching to, to a sour cream versus, um, versus a milk might um, get you where you need to be. So just some things to consider and, and think about. So with that, that was all of the information that I, I wanted to share. So before we open it up for questions, um, again, if you um, have a few minutes, please um, consider taking the evaluation survey. Your feedback is really important as it does help guide future programming. Lauren is gonna share that link in the chat or you can scan the QR code or I will also include it in the follow-up email that'll come early next week. And then next month is our last webinar for the year. I can't believe it's almost December. Um, and we're completely switching gears, um, not talking about food preservation methods or, or anything like that, but we'll be talking about safe food temperatures um, with um, from storage to just cooking and, and holding. Um, so you can follow the link that Lauren's sharing in the chat or scan the QR code. Um, hope to see you there. So with that, um, thank you. And I will stop sharing and um, we'll open.